So a few months ago, you may have seen that I published a video comparing the Flood account in Genesis with the Flood account found in the Epic of Gilgamesh. My point was the data didn't indicate literary borrowing between the accounts, and they likely stem from earlier oral traditions. But when I was going over the Epic of Gilgamesh, I noted that at the end, Gilgamesh obtained a plant that would rejuvenate the body, until he took a bath and a serpent stole it. Several commenters remarked that I ignored how this parallels Genesis 3, with regards to Adam and Eve losing access to the Tree of Life due to a serpent deceiving them. Well, the reason I ignored it is because scholars like Trigve Medinger and Jeffrey Tige have already looked into this and note there is little to no evidence the account of Adam and Eve was crafted by borrowing themes or stories from Mesopotamian tales. So let's look at a few candidates, including the Epic of Gilgamesh. At the turn of the 20th century, one view among scholars was something known as Pan-Babylonianism. This is the idea that the stories and religious ideas throughout the Middle East can be traced back to Babylonian and Sumerian myths. Mark Shavalas documents that when it came to the biblical texts, the idea was that Israelite civilization was derived from Babylonia, that many Babylonian features were still clung to by the Judeo-Christian religious tradition by way of the Old Testament. Many alleged parallels were put forward to try and show how most of what the Bible says was derived from Mesopotamian myths. Some even suggested the story of Jesus was a retelling of the Epic of Gilgamesh. However, Shavalas also notes the Pan-Babylonians, however, were considered indiscriminate in their hypotheses, and most of their extreme ideas were rejected by both biblical and Assyriological scholars. Philologists began to show that the linguistic parallels were superficial. So the idea many of the biblical stories were directly or indirectly borrowed from Mesopotamian legends had a decent following about a hundred years ago, but today this theory seems to be a minority view. Most scholars do not think the biblical accounts were directly taken from or directly inspired by known Mesopotamian legends, and for good reasons. To demonstrate this, let's start with a comparison. In Mayan mythology, one of the divine twin heroes transforms himself into a hummingbird to woo the daughter of a mountain deity. But obviously, the Mayans must have gotten this story from ancient Greece. Why? Because the ancient Greeks had a similar story. Except it was the god Zeus who changed into a swan to sleep with Queen Leda. Obviously, the Mayans took the story of Leda and the swan and adapted it for their cultural needs. We can also see how the Mayans adopted the Greek god's war with the Titans into their own mythology. In Greek mythology, Cronus the Titan kills his father, the god Uranus. The Titans then rule the universe and Cronus kills his children so that the same will not happen to him. Zeus, son of Cronus, is hid away by his mother, and when he grows up, he leads the other gods in a war with the Titans. After securing victory, Zeus changed the Titans in the underworld and begins a new age. The Mayans must have taken this idea and reworked it into their culture. In their mythology, the Greek gods are represented by the hero twins. Their father and their uncle were killed by the gods of the underworld, similar to how the titans were eventually chained in the underworld. The twins were taken and hidden away by their mother, and when they grew up, they traveled to the underworld and defeated the deities there, and what followed was a new age began. Now obviously, I'm not being serious with this comparison. I do not think Greek mythology was borrowed and reworked by the Mayans. My point is that it is easy to ignore and dismiss the differences between these two cultures and only focus on similarities and then draw unreasonable connections. You can make anything work by cherry picking correlations and then assuming there must be a causal link, but correlation is not causation. For example, Douglas Bush satirically made a case the Book of Pride and Prejudice was filled with hidden references to numerous Greek gods. His point being is that you can read parallels in anything if that is what you're looking for. Likewise, just because we can find random and vague similarities in Genesis to things we can read in Mesopotamian literature, that doesn't mean there is a connection, let alone that the Hebrews constructed Genesis by borrowing from Mesopotamian legends. The mere existence of a vague similarity does not mean one copied the other. For example, 
Gezeroim, notes within the Noi Noi tribe of Australia. There was a belief about where death came from that sounds very similar to Genesis 3. The legend says that the first man and woman were forbidden to go near a sacred tree where a divine being that manifested as a bat lived in. One day the woman approached the tree while collecting wood for fire. The bat flew away and death came into the world after that. This is obviously similar to the account of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. Creationists could easily claim this as evidence that other cultures knew about the Genesis account, and skeptics could explain this away by saying the story came from missionary influence. But Roim, who studied the issue, notes it probably developed independently as a result of sex symbolism within their own culture. So just because we can find similarities to Genesis in other cultures, that doesn't suggest a literary parallel. We have to be careful about deriving a causal link from mere similarities. The differences between the Australian tribe and Genesis vastly outweigh this one similarity. Now some might say this analogy doesn't work because there was no cultural connection between Israel and Australia, but there definitely was exchanges and mixing of ideas among the cultures of the ancient Near East. Well, this is true, but this doesn't necessarily mean they were borrowing each other's legends. Sometimes there was borrowing, like how the Greek pantheon became the Roman pantheon. But sometimes, scholars have assumed more than what the evidence allows. For example, Stephen Hidgmans notes that many earlier scholars thought that the sun god Sol Invictus was really a Syrian deity imported into Rome. This was heavily based on mere correlations of sun worship. Hidgmans demonstrated the evidence actually suggests Sol Invictus was likely a Roman deity without a connection to Syria. The existence of cultural intermingling and correlations on sun worship is not enough to suggest Rome imported a Syrian deity. The evidence actually demonstrates Sol Invictus was likely a Roman idea. And likewise, given the differences between Genesis and Mesopotamian tales, it is unlikely Israel was borrowing from Mesopotamia when writing their account of Genesis 2-3. The Eden narrative is most likely a unique Israelite origin account. Let's start with the Epic of Gilgamesh. Two parts of the epic have been argued were inspiration for the Eden narrative in Genesis. In the beginning of the epic, the gods create a wild man called Enkidu, who lives among the wild animals. Eventually, a prostitute is sent to bring him back to the city of Uruk, so he can befriend Gilgamesh. The prostitute sleeps with Enkidu for one or two weeks and teaches him the ways of civilization. After this, the animals will not come near Enkidu, symbolizing that he has now become civilized and is no longer like the wild animals. Some have suggested this is similar to the account of Adam and Eve. At first they live in the Garden of Eden with various animals, but after partaking of the forbidden fruit, they are expelled from the garden. Shortly after in Genesis 4, we see the beginning of civilization. A second and more interesting similarity is at the end of the epic. After Enkidu dies, Gilgamesh journeyed to the edge of the world where he meets Utnapishtim. As we discussed in our video on the flood account in Gilgamesh, Utnapishtim and his wife are the flood heroes who built a vessel to survive the storm. But after the flood, they were granted immortality. Gilgamesh visits Utnapishtim in hopes of learning how he might obtain immortality. This is something he is unable to obtain. But Utnapishtim says at the bottom of the sea, there is a plant that can rejuvenate the body. Gilgamesh manages to obtain the plant, but on his way back to Uruk, he stops to bathe and a serpent steals the plant. Some suggest this is similar to when Adam and Eve lost access to the tree of life by being deceived by a serpent to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Like Gilgamesh, a serpent caused them to lose access to a plant that could have granted immortality or rejuvenated the body. Yeah, so skeptics want us to believe that Jewish scribes got together at some point in the past and said, you know this pagan epic that claims gods other than Yahweh rule? I think we should take this section where the wild humanoid sleeps with a prostitute and use them as our oldest known ancestors that were set up to rule as priests in God's sacred garden. Then we'll change the sexual activity to an act of eating forbidden fruit to explain why they had to leave and their descendants built civilization elsewhere. Now this Enkidu doesn't make it to the end guys. So let's also take this part about Gilgamesh swimming to the bottom of the ocean 
to find that special plant. Except we'll move the plant to the garden, turn it into a tree, and say it would allow them to live forever instead of just rejuvenating the body. And instead of the serpent stealing it, we'll just have the serpent talk to them to eat from another tree that they're forbidden to eat from. Also, we'll skip over the Bull of Heaven episode, the trip to Cedar Mountain, and all these other sections of the epic, because I don't really want to include any allusions to these parts. Sound good, guys? And then everyone clapped. Do I even need to count the unnecessary assumptions this theory adds? Wouldn't a simpler explanation be that each culture had their own ideas that just happened to have some overlap? As I noted earlier, when you ignore the differences, it is easy to find parallels in different cultures. Humans have natural tendencies to seek out patterns, but that doesn't mean there is always a pattern to find. David Carr is one scholar that argues the Epic of Gilgamesh was a precursor for the Eden narrative. But his argument is based on picking out similar themes and motifs and trying to draw a connection, which is very speculative. On top of that, he even has to admit that Genesis 2 and 3 does not represent a reformulation of any Mesopotamian texts, including Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh's main theme is on man's quest for immortality, which is not the theme of Genesis 2 to 3, where there is no theme of humans searching for a way to obtain immortality. The Serpent of Gilgamesh only comes in at the end, whereas the serpent is an essential character in Genesis 3. Beyond this, the plants are different, their properties and location are different, and there's no emphasis on acquiring wisdom in Gilgamesh. Adam and Eve already have immortality and lose it, whereas immortality is always beyond Gilgamesh's reach. Enkidu is not the ancestor of the authors, nor does he ever have children, and the prostitute is not a good parallel for Eve. These are just a sample of many of the differences between Gilgamesh and the Eden narrative. As Carr has to admit, these contrasts are evidence that Genesis 2 and 3 does not simply mirror such non-biblical traditions on this point. At most, its treatment of the motif of humans unknowingly losing a chance at immortality is a distant echo of more focused treatments of mortality, such as that seen in the Gilgamesh epic. Again, if Carr is correct that Gilgamesh is a precursor of Genesis, he has to admit it would represent a quite fluid adaptation of its Near Eastern precursors. But given the vast amount of differences, it's more likely Gilgamesh and Genesis only share similar themes and motifs because they share the same wider cultural background, not because one is a fluid adaptation of the other. Like with the earlier examples, just because we can find similar stories in different cultures, that doesn't mean one culture was creating a fluid adaptation of the other's stories. Furthermore, there might not even be a serpent in Gilgamesh. Jeffrey Tige notes, the serpent is referred to as a ground lion. Some take this as simply an epithet of the serpent, but others following the testimony of Akkadian lexical texts take ground lion as chameleon, which etymologically means ground lion. So Gilgamesh might not even be referring to a serpent, which would make the similarity to Genesis even less likely. Either way, there are far more differences than similarities between Gilgamesh and Genesis. For example, G. Herbert Livingstone notes, the tree of knowledge of good and evil has no parallel in pagan literature. Another ancient myth is something called the Tale of Adapa, which others have suggested could have been a source used for Genesis. If you haven't heard of it, the myth is about the sage Adapa, who was a priest at Eridu and served the god Ea. Adapa would catch fish as offerings for Ea in his temple, and in return, Ea gave Adapa the gift of wisdom. One day during a fishing expedition, a south wind caused his boat to capsize. Adapa pronounced a curse, which caused the wind to stop. But this broke the cosmic order and caused a drought in the land. The head god Anu called Adapa to heaven to account for his actions. But before he goes, his patron god Ea warns that he must not accept food or drink in heaven, as it would be the food and drink of death. Upon arriving in heaven, the two gods Tammuz and Gishzeta see Adapa in mourning and intercede on his behalf before Anu. After this, Anu offers Adapa food and drink that will make him immortal, but he instructs Tammuz and Gishzeta to offer the food and drink to him. Gishzeta is associated with serpents and depictions, and his name means 
Lord of the Good Tree. But Adapa refuses because of the advice of Ea. So he's sent back to Earth, having lost the chance to achieve immortality, but was still able to obtain wisdom. The ending of the text is lost, so we don't know how it ends. Some argue there's a connection to the Eden narrative, because Adapa, like Adam, lost immortality but obtained wisdom, while in service of the gods. Furthermore, the name Adapa might be etymologically related to Adam, and Adapa may also be the same person as another character from Sumerian mythology, known as Oans, who was one of the seven sages who taught civilization to humanity. However, there are a lot of problems with this theory. First, a connection with the sage Oans is speculative. Trigbe Meninger notes, the relationship between Adapa and Oans is not quite clear. Some scholars assume that they are identical, and others do not. It may well be that two originally independent characters merged in the course of time. The name Adapa doesn't seem to be etymologically related to the name Adam, which means man. Adapa seems to mean recovered from the water, so merely sounding the same doesn't mean there is necessarily a connection. Additionally, the accounts are drastically different if we do not cherry pick out the similarities. Livingstone says, As a literary production, Genesis 2 and 3 have no parallel in ancient Near Eastern literature. The epic of Adapa, often presented as a parallel, is not really so, either in literary structure, in moral emphasis, or in theological content. Menninger notes there is a vast amount of differences. Adapa is set without a garden, a wife, a serpent, or without a temptation to disobey a god. The foods are different, and the sin is different. Adam and Eve disobey a divine command. Adapa pronounces a curse to break the wind and causes a drought. Adapa is freely granted wisdom. Adam takes wisdom without God's permission. Adam is granted access to immortality, but loses it upon disobedience. Adapa is denied immortality by Ea, and is fooled into rejecting it from Anu. Adapa is also presented as a cultural hero, whereas Adam is not presented as an ideal for human behavior. A theme of the Adapa myth is that death is what is ordained for humanity, whereas in the Eden narrative, death is presented as something God did not want for humanity. Additionally, critics only focus on Gish Zitta and overlook that Tammuz also is offering food and drink, and he is a god of shepherds which has no connection to the Eden narrative. Gesira only appears to be associated with snakes, and the meaning of his name is likely connected with his role as an agricultural god, not because he's associated with a specific tree. Moreover, Gesira is instructed by Anu to offer food that makes one immortal alongside Tammuz. The serpent of Genesis offers fruit that makes one wise to the wife of Adam in rebellion against God. So when we account for the differences, it is hard to see any connection that stands out. The theme of both narratives appears to be vastly different, and they only have some minor overlap by coincidence. Jeffrey Tige thinks there might be a loose connection, but he also has to admit, these parallels are fragmentary, dealing with only a few motifs each, and the discrepancies in detail are often great. How these gaps were bridged cannot be said with certainty, presumably because of ignorance of the process of transmission of ancient Near Eastern literature to the Bible. Finally, some try to draw a connection to the tale of Enki and Ninhursag, which speaks of a land that resembles Eden called Dilmun. Dilmun was said to be in the east, and it was also said to be a paradise without death or sickness and where animals lived in harmony. The sun god also watered the land to make it fertile, and then the earth goddess gave birth to eight plants, but the water god Enki devoured them. The earth goddess cursed Enki, which almost led to his death, but then she healed his rib to save his life, and therefore she was known as the Lady of the Rib. Like with the other narratives, this one has many more differences than similarities to the Eden narrative. Tige admits, The differences are also significant. Most noticeable is the far more natural configuration of the narrative in Genesis 2-3, in contrast to the fantastic or supernatural nature of the other accounts. The Eden narrative is about the activity of humans in a geographically identifiable land. Dilmun is a land where gods dwell, and is about their activity there. The Earth Goddess is named Lady of the Rib because she heals the rib of Enki, which is not at all similar to Genesis, 
except for a possible mention of a rib. But R.K. Harrison also notes the phrase might not mean the lady of the rib, but instead mean the lady who makes alive. Also, the Hebrew word for rib is not even in Genesis. The Hebrew word actually means side and refers to the entire side of something, not just a rib bone. So any possible connection this tale would have to Genesis is very flimsy. This is why Richard Hess can say, in the study of the material on Genesis 1 to 3, so many facile comparisons have been made with ancient Near Eastern myths, and so many far-reaching conclusions posited. Now, I'm not denying that Israel shared many cultural themes and beliefs with its neighbors. For example, divine serpent figures are present in Mesopotamia, Canaan, and Egypt. There definitely were shared ideas and generalized beliefs across cultures. But this doesn't mean they were always copying or reacting to each other's legends and histories. Just like Stephen Hidgmans notes that just because Syrians and Romans had a sun deity, that doesn't mean one was copying the other. They are part of a wider culture that share general themes and motifs. We are also not denying that it is possible that Jewish scribes decided to pick random sections out of pagan myths as the basis for their own history. The argument is that such a theory adds too many unnecessary assumptions. It seems far more likely the narratives of Mesopotamia and Israel came about independently and share some similarities because they're part of a wider culture that shared general ideas. As far as we have available, there is little to no evidence to eat a narrative borrowed from any known pagan myths, epics, or tales.